Hello class and welcome to today's lecture over biotechnology chapter 20. Now I'm hoping that you guys have had some time to go over some of the Khan Academy lessons and gotten some background on biotechnology. If not, this will be your first exposure. Guys, if you have your note outline, you could have that out, fill this along as we go through the notes, or you could just listen and try to absorb this information. And guys, when it comes to biotechnology, some of my favorite topics come into play, like you know, designing genetically um, enhanced humans, possibly uh, gene therapy, uh, genetic cloning of organisms, GMO foods, kind of like what the future is heading towards is this idea of biotechnology, especially with our discovery of CRISPR, which we'll discuss if you actually listen to the lecture or the Zoom meeting on uh, yesterday, you actually got a little introduction to that CRISPR and what it's leading us to be able to do in the future when it comes to genetics. But guys, let's focus on our notes right now. And guys, first thing we have to do is define some terms. And one of the biggest terms we have to define is something that actually allowed us to start making advancements in biotechnology, and that is what we call recombinant DNA. And guys, when it comes to recombinant DNA, it's pretty much what it sounds like. It's combining DNA from two different sources into one DNA molecule, usually done in vitro. And guys, in vitro, for those who don't know, that means in a test tube or outside the body, usually in a test tube or in a Petri dish. And that's usually what happens. This is where we usually get two different species of DNA, and combine them. It's something that we would have done if we were in class. We would combine DNA from bacteria, from E. coli, and combine it with DNA of a jellyfish that glows in the dark, and we would combine it, making it recombinant DNA. So once again, often different species of DNA, uh, example, bacterial DNA and animal DNA, you could combine. And guys, this allowed us to do huge advancements and pretty much led to this field of study called genetic engineering, which is the, ge the direct manipulation of genes for practical purposes. Genetic engineering is now being able not to just to manipulate the gene, but also its products for not evil purposes like making clones to take over the world but for more practical uh, practical purposes for example maybe manufacturing protein products like a blood clotting factor or growth hormone so it's for more kind of once again practical purposes for human society now some other terms biotechnology that's pretty much what we're studying. It's not. It's the manipulation of not just the gene, but also the entire organism or any of their components. So genetic engineering is part of biotechnology to make these useful products. And guys, biotechnology is something that they've been doing for thousands of years. It goes way back to farmers and ranchers doing selective breeding of livestock, crops. Even back when monks would use microbes and still do for making wine and cheese. That's kind of very early on biotechnology, using an entire organism, manipulating it to make some sort of useful product. But now when we think of biotechnology, we think more of genetic engineering, but that's just part of biotechnology. So once again, it also, once again, modern uses enable scientists to move genes between organisms and modify genes and organisms. Um, example, gene therapy, DNA microarrays, which is what this is right here, kind of looks like a light bright, but it's a DNA microarray that shows, you know, in each one of these little dots, there's actually a, a gene or an mRNA, and it's showing transcription or translation. Usually green means that they're doing a lot of transcription. Yellow, uh, a little bit. Red means no transcription whatsoever. Um, gene cloning, once again, all these things kind of fit under the umbrella of biotechnology. And here you just see some pictures of, you know, things we associate with biotechnology. GMO foods, which we'll have a short discussion about. Gene therapy, cloning, uh, once again, gene manipulation, transferring genes from one organism to another. And guys, I have a picture of woolly mammoth because I don't know if you guys know, they are in the process now of trying to possibly clone a woolly mammoth. We actually found woolly mammoths trapped in ice. We were able to extract their DNA, and they're now at the part where they're trying to figure out, okay, if we do this, what's the final steps? You know, what are they going to use as a surrogate mother? They're probably thinking, you know, it's either the Asian or the African elephant, its closest ancestor. 
but they're also looking at the ethical concerns. You know, should they do this? Should they not do this? So kind of cool. Maybe in your lifetime, maybe when you're a little bit older, you might take your kids to a zoo and they might actually be looking at a woolly mammoth, which is just, that would be awesome. My concern is I might not be able to see this, but I, I would be okay not seeing it, but I would really want to taste what a woolly mammoth burger tastes like. That would actually be kind of cool. I'm just kidding. No, I wouldn't eat a woolly mammoth burger. So let's look at the steps of cloning a gene. So usually when we hear cloning, we think of making copies of another person or another organism. But when we look at gene cloning, it's making just copies of a gene. It's amplifying a gene. That's pretty much what the definition is. So it's the process of preparing well-defined gene-sized pieces of DNA in multiple identical copies. So it's just making huge amounts of a gene, not the entire DNA, but just a gene. And usually we use bacteria, phages, plasmids to kind of clone our genes for biotechnology. So what we're gonna do is talk about the plasmid because that's what we would have done in our class. Guys, a plasmid is this small ring of DNA. It's this extra DNA that we find in bacteria. It's circular in shape. It's not part of the bacterial chromosome. It's separate and not all bacteria will have plasmids, but some will. And it's a very small piece of DNA in a circular shape here. You see pictures of some plasmids with the bacterial DNA, that's its chromosome, but then they might have these extra pieces of DNA called plasmids. They're also found in some eukaryotes like yeast. Yeast might have plasmids as well. So there are steps to cloning a gene. So we're gonna look at those steps. First thing is you isolate a plasmid from a bacteria. And there's steps to do this. You lyse the bacteria so open and there's technique to just get the plasmid out. Then what you do is you're going to cut the plasmid open and you're going to insert whatever piece of DNA, whatever gene you want to amplify, that you want to clone, that you want to copy. And guys, there's a big tool here that we use to cut the plasmid, cut the DNA, and kind of insert it all together. And that's in this set of notes. It's gonna come out a little bit later, but I'll give you a little preview. This would be where we use a restriction enzyme to cut the plasmid, cut our piece of DNA that we wanna make copies of, and then we kind of just paste it together. Then what we do is we get that plasmid that's now a recombinant plasmid because now it's gonna have DNA from two different sources. Then we put it back into a bacteria. There's ways to do that. There's something called heat shocking where you kind of heat the bacteria, you shock it for about a minute. It opens up these pores in the cell membrane and cell wall and it allows the plasmid to go in there. And then you put it on ice right away, kind of closing those pores, trapping the plasmid inside. So once again, this is gonna allow us to reproduce that clone, make huge amounts of our gene that we wanna clone. Then what we do is we put that bacteria in a Petri dish and we let it do what it does best. We let it reproduce. We put it in an incubator, like a little oven, set it about 98.6, and we just let it run for a day or two and it just starts dividing like crazy. And what it does is every copy from that bacteria will now have a gene, it will have a clone of that gene. So it's making a copy of all of its DNA before it divides, including the plasmid, including our recombinant DNA, and it's gonna clone it. So now we're gonna have multiple copies of that inserted foreign DNA. And now we're able to use that clone in a lot of different ways. Sometimes there's kind of big, two big reasons why we do this. One is just to make huge amounts of that gene. And now you know you could possibly sell that gene or give it away to other people to do research on that gene. Or what you can do is you could allow that bacteria to produce the protein product. For example, let's say you wanted to make copies of the insulin gene. And let's say you just leave it in the bacteria. Well, the bacteria will transcribe and translate that code, that genetic code, that DNA into the protein product of insulin. And now you could get that insulin and give it to humans who might be you know, insulin deficient, like people with diabetes. And guys, this is something that most diabetes uh, patients now do, is they get their insulin through this way. Before this, they would have to get insulin from goats or horses, which sometimes was not pure, it wasn't purified, there was issues or incompatibility, but now this is a lot more cleaner technique, less issues, letting bacteria actually make human insulin.
So once again, these cloaked genes can be isolated from bacteria to use in basic research, or they could possibly endow an organism with some new metabolic capabilities, such as pest resistance. That's another thing you could use it for. So here we have a picture of kind of looking at the steps. So once again, we take the plasmid out of a bacteria. We get our gene as well out of, let's say, it's an animal cell. And what we do, this is where we would use our restriction enzyme. We would cut this, cut this with restriction enzyme, and then we're going to be able to connect it to our plasmid. So now this plasmid is a recombinant plasmid. It has DNA from two different sources. Let's say this is cloning the human insulin gene. So this is all bacterial DNA, but this is the human insulin gene. Then what you do is you put it back into a bacteria. Once again, we use heat shocking for this. Then you plate the bacteria, you let it divide like crazy. And then there's a lot of things you can do. For example, you could allow it to make that protein product. And let's say it's insulin. Now you could sell it to people with diabetes or give it to people with diabetes. Maybe it's human growth hormone. So they could give to people who you know are undersized and maybe need the human growth hormone to maybe get a little bit more height. Maybe it's a protein that dissolves blood clots and heart attack therapy. Maybe it's a blood clotting factor for people who have hemophilia. So that's something you could do. Or possibly you could get that gene out that you've now made huge amounts of copies and maybe try to introduce it into new organisms. Maybe you introduce it, maybe this is a gene for a resistance for some sort of a pet, some sort of bug, now you could introduce it to plants, they will express it, and now that bug will leave them alone. Or maybe it's used to modify bacteria. For example, one of the first things they used this technique for was to give bacteria this ability to digest oil. So now whenever there's an oil spill, they'll kind of throw this bacteria and help it digest some of the oil in the ocean. So once again, a lot of good uses for this technique of cloning a gene. And here we have pretty much the same thing, just straight out of your textbook, pretty much just the same image. So guys, I'm gonna stop here. This is part one of the lecture, just to make it a little bit more compact. I'll be making another one for the rest of these notes where I talk about restriction enzymes. So that's it for our lecture today. Guys, stay tuned. Once again, another lecture should be dropping soon. Make sure you check in Moto daily. And guys, have yourself an awesome day today. Hello class, so let's pick up right where we left off. So we talked about how we clone a gene. A big part of being able to clone a gene is the following, the discovery of restriction enzymes. And this was a huge discovery. The discovery of restriction enzymes allowed us to do things like recombinant DNA, genetic engineering. So let's talk about what these are. So when it comes to restriction enzymes, once again, they allowed us the possibility of doing genetic engineering, doing gene cloning, making recombinant DNA. Now, what is a restriction enzyme? It is a decorative enzyme that recognizes and cuts DNA into pieces, into fragments, what we call restriction fragments. Now, restriction enzymes are sometimes called restriction endonucleases. So you might hear it called either one of those. But once again, their job, they're like a pair of scissors. They cut DNA. Now, in nature, where did we find these in nature? We found them in bacteria cells. Because bacteria, the one thing they need to fear is viruses. There are always viruses called bacterial phages that attack bacteria. The one defense bacteria has against viruses is restriction enzymes. Now, I don't know if you guys know, but when a virus like a bacterial phage attacks a bacteria, the first thing it does, it injects its DNA into the cell of the bacteria, and it tries to use that DNA to take over the cell. It completely tokes over the cell, and it pretty much makes it a whole cell. Well, the one protection they have is these restriction enzymes, which can cut up that viral DNA, making it pretty much non-active. But once again, not all bacteria, though, have restriction enzymes. So now some of you might be like, whoa, what protects the bacteria against their own restriction enzymes? Bacteria cells protect their own DNA from their restriction enzymes by doing DNA methylation. They can methylate their DNA, which kind of protects their DNA from being cut. Now, I mentioned how restriction enzymes are like a pair of scissors, but they're not just a random pair of scissors cutting wherever they want. They recognize specific sites where they have to cut called restriction sites. 
there's these short specific nucleotide sequences that we find in DNA, and they're gonna cut right at these specific sequences. So it's a very specific pair of scissors. And guys, we have discovered hundreds of different types of restriction enzymes, and all of them recognize a different nucleotide sequences. They all cut slightly different from each other. So each restriction enzyme is very specific. They recognize a particular short DNA sequence or restriction site, and they're gonna cut in a particular manner. Now, when it comes to the way they cut, the most useful ones for at least gene cloning, making recombinant DNA, are the ones that cut in a very specific manner that leave what we call sticky ends. Now, first, let's talk about these uh, restriction sites. Now, these recognition sequences, these recognition sites, restriction sites, what we've noticed is they tend to be symmetric in that the same sequence of usually from four to eight bases, nucleotides is found on both strands, but they run in opposite directions. So it's like a palindrome. Can you guys think of some words that are palindrome? Maybe you're thinking race car or kayak or mom, dad, all those would be palindromes. Well, the sequences, these recognition sequences are palindrome sequences as well. For example, here's one. G-A-A-T-T-C, and notice on the other strand, it runs the same, but just going backwards, G-A-A-T-T-C. Now, restriction enzymes usually cut the phosphodiester, the covalent bonds on the sides of the ladder, and they cut usually in a staggered manner. At least the ones that are most useful cut in a staggered manner that they leave these double-stranded fragments that have single-stranded ends called sticky ends. So we're going to have one sticky end right here uh, for our DNA. We're going to have another sticky end at this side. So let me show you a picture of what these sticky ends kind of look like. So here's an example of one of the first restriction enzymes that we discovered called ECO-R1. ECO, E. coli, that's where we found it. R for restriction enzyme one because it's the first one that they found and they found many others in E. coli, but this is the first one. Now, it always recognizes, once again, G-A-A-T-T-C. Notice it's the same sequence just going backwards. And this is the way it's gonna cut. It's gonna cut between the guanine and adenine right there, breaking that phosphodiester bond and it breaks this phosphodiester bond as well. Now remember, these are hydrogen bonds holding the basis. Those are weak, so they're gonna detach pretty easily. So here in this picture, notice we're gonna make some recombinant DNA. Let's say this is some bacterial DNA, and let's say this is some human DNA. Maybe it's the gene for insulin. As long as you use the same type of restriction enzyme, they're both gonna look for that sequence of GAATTC, and they find it on both. Then they're gonna cut right there, right there. They're gonna cut there and there. And notice how they leave, this is what we call a sticky end. Notice it's one strand that kind of sticks out, four bases that don't have another base pair over here. And notice if you mix them together, these bases are complementary to each other. So they're going to base pair with each other and boom, we have recombinant DNA. Now, notice this is not solidified. These are hydrogen bonds, they're pretty weak. Guys, what's the one enzyme we need to throw in here to solidify this, to make this concrete and one complete recombinant DNA? And hopefully you're thinking back and you're saying DNA ligase. You are right if that's what you said. That's the last thing you have to do. DNA ligase, put it in there, and it's going to seal this and make it into a now fully concrete recombinant DNA. Now, I mentioned the ones that are most useful are the ones that leave sticky ends. Those are the ones that we could use for genetic cloning, for genetic engineering. Uh, but like I mentioned, those unions are temporary. They're held by hydrogen bonds. You've got to add that DNA ligase, add that DNA ligase in there, and you make it permanent, you make it concrete. Now, not all restriction enzymes will cut in a manner that give you sticky ends. Some might give you what we call blunt end cuts where what they do is they find a sequence. For example, this is one for a restriction enzyme called small one, SMA1. It looks for this sequence, CCCGGG. Notice it's the same sequence, but going backwards. And it cuts right down the middle of this one. Notice no sticky ends. That's a blunt and cut. These don't tend to be useful for genetic engineering purposes because we're not going to be able to see any sticky ends. We can't really throw another piece of DNA that's going to be able to base pair.
So here is just a figure straight out of your book, just going over the steps of restriction enzyme. So notice we get a plasmid. There's our sequence for E4, one, GGA, GAA, TTC. Notice it's the same sequence on the other strand. We throw in a restriction enzyme. It cuts it right in that manner, leaving sticky ends. This is our DNA of interest that we want to make huge copies of. As long as you use that same E4, one, it doesn't have to be the same one, but just the same type they're gonna cut that leaf sticky ends that are complementary. Then you add some DNA ligase and boom, you're gonna have some recall. And these are the same steps except blown up a little bit bigger. So once again, notice restriction enzyme cuts the sugar phosphate, the phosphodiester bond or the covalent bond. It leaves sticky ends. Then we have our gene of interest, which you cut with the same type of restriction enzyme and notice it has sticky ends that are complementary to these of our plasmid. You mix them together, they're gonna base pair. Last thing you have to do, boom, add some DNA ligase. And now you have recombinant DNA concrete, uh, solidified uh, permanent recombinant DNA, DNA from two different sources. So class, I wanna show one last video that kind of puts everything together. The steps of cloning a gene but also now in throwing in the restriction enzyme and how it's gonna cut the plasmid and also cut our human DNA so we could get maybe this piece right here that's maybe a human insulin gene into our plasmid. So it combines everything together. Now they are gonna talk about a lac -Z gene, uh, but those are some extra details that we don't need to dive too much into. I want you to get a better idea of just the steps on how we go about cloning a gene. We can use the techniques of DNA technology to recombine and copy genes. A restriction enzyme is used to cut open a plasmid, a small circular DNA molecule obtained from a bacterium. The plasmid serves as a cloning vector. The restriction enzyme cuts only at a certain DNA base sequence, called a restriction site. Notice those the same ends. enzyme is used to cut up DNA sticky obtained from well. a human cell. The human gene must be cloned to produce copies for use or study. A bacterium is induced to take up the recombinant plasmid from the surrounding solution in a process called transformation. This isn't as clear cut as it sounds. Some bacteria do not take up the plasmid and some take up plasmids whose lack Z genes lack the inserted human DNA. A bacterium is placed on a growth medium. It replicates the plasmid at the same time as its own DNA. Its descendants form a clone of bacteria that all have copies of the recombinant plasmid. The ampicillin in the medium limits growth only to plasmid containing cells. But which cells have plasmids with a human gene? Bacteria without human genes have intact lac -Z genes. This allows them to break down a substance in the medium that stains their colonies blue. Thus, the bacteria with human genes are in the colorless colonies. Okay, and there you saw a video. Now, once again, that's kind of showing you making sure there's a selection process at the end because when you cut open a plasmid, it could easily just reseal itself and not pick up any piece of DNA whatsoever. But usually the genius of the restriction enzyme, it cuts right in the middle of a lac -Z gene. So if it picks up, a piece of DNA, the DNA we want to possibly clone, it's going to have an interrupted lac -Z gene. That means it's not going to be able to break down that lactose sugar and it stays colorless where the blue ones are breaking down the actual lactose. So we know those did not pick up a gene. It's the white colonies that we want to culture. We get those colonies, pick them up and plate them on a brand new plate. And now we'll just have our DNA, the gene that we wanted to clone, we'll have huge amounts of copies of that one now. So guys, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, there's one more lecture that I'll drop that talks about gel electrophoresis and PCR. But once again, you guys hopefully are doing the Khan Academy lessons and getting more of that background. Guys, today is Wednesday, tomorrow's Thursday. It is the Quizzies mid knowledge, um, midweek knowledge check. Make sure that you guys log into the Quizzies and get that quiz done. Well guys, that's all for today. Once again, I'll drop one more lecture probably tonight or early tomorrow morning over the last part of this set of notes. Guys, have an awesome day.